You're listening to a message from Gateway Church Geelong. We hope it blesses you. For more information about Gateway, visit gc.org.au. Guys, I'm so grateful for this opportunity to come around the word with you this morning. And um, as I've been preparing, there's, there's this real sense, and even in the prayer meeting this morning, that God is going to speak to your heart individually, that God is going to minister to you personally. God is going to show his power, his love and his truth to you. So can I encourage you, lean in, be prepared, that as I speak, he's going to speak to your heart. So let's pray, guys. Holy Spirit, I just thank you that, that you minister to us, that you speak to our hearts. And I just pray as, as I speak that you will speak individually to me and to each and every person here so that we would know your truth, your love and your power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So is anyone here interested in history, architecture, old buildings, show of hands? Anyone? Oh, there's a few fans here. I'm going to be honest, I wasn't. Probably still not. Um, History was my worst subject in school, like worst, worst subject in school. Um, And didn't really like architecture because it was a lot of detail and design, not a strength of mine. But that all changed when I travelled to Europe and history came alive. So one of the places that I visited with some friends who were architectural students, so of course they wanted to go to every single building and do every single tour on those buildings because they wanted to know everything about the history. But one of the buildings we visited in Spain was in Barcelona was the La Sagrada Familia. La Sagrada Familia. La Sagrada Familia is a cathedral or basilica that was built. Um, It started being built in 1882. The initial architect was Francisco de Villa, but later on it was taken over by Anton Gaudi. Gaudi is one of um, the famous architects who's designed many of the buildings in Barcelona suits. Now, this is a quote that Gaudi's primary goal was to build a church that had facades that highlighted the phases in the life of Jesus. See, when Gaudi designed the building, when he designed the cathedral, he had an intention or a design in mind. The construction started in 1882. Interestingly, though, it's one of the cathedrals that is still not finished. So it's still not a completed work. It's still a work in progress. They're still working on the building, 1882, what's that, over 200 years later? They're estimating that it might be completed in 2026, but with COVID and everything, there was delays to that, so who knows what would happen. During the Spanish Civil War in 1936-39, the basilica was heavily damaged and restorative work had to take place. So it's super interesting because it's a work in progress. It's still being constructed. But in the midst of all that, that's restorative work that has to take place. See, this building reminds me a little bit of our, our journey as followers of Jesus, as our journey as Christians. That, you know, at, at salvation, when we come to know Jesus, that we were created with intent, with design. We were created for relationship with God. Just like Gaudi had an intent for building this La Sagrada Familia, God created you and I for relationship with him. That, that through sin entering the world, that created separation between his God. But as we heard about from Pastor Azi in communion, that through the redemptive work that Jesus did on the cross, you and I can be restored to right relationship with God. That you and I can walk closely with him. But after we are saved, after we come to know Jesus, we're still a work in progress. Kind of like the Lissa Grada Familia, we're still a work in progress of becoming more Christ, of outworking the things we have gone through. And just like the building was damaged in the Spanish Civil War, sometimes for a lot of us, we take on some damage in our lives through life circumstances, whether of our own doing or others doing, whether things we planned for, we didn't, things in our control, out of control. And so there's some restorative work that needs to take place. My friend, the encouragement I have for you is God is doing and will continue to do the restorative work in our lives. What an amazing promise we have that He will do restorative work in our lives. So if you're taking notes this morning, the title of my message is Restorative Power. So can I encourage you that God is a God of restoration? But what is, actually is restoration? Like we use that word a lot, don't we? So I looked it up in the dictionary um, and it says restoring or restore is to bring back or return something or someone to a previous good condition or position, or also to re-establish something back into existence. God speaks of and promises his restoration to re-establish, to bring back, to restore, 
things back into existence. How amazing is this? What, what great promises we have. In Psalm 23 verse 3, it says, He refreshes and restores my soul. He leads me in parts of righteousness for His own name's sake. He restores our souls. You know, when you're feeling distress, when your emotions, your mind will and emotions, your soul is in turmoil, that He brings rest. He brings comfort. He brings peace. He settles the unsettledness. In Joel 2.25, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten. Locusts speak of damage, of loss. They bring damage. They bring loss. Yes, we may experience loss. We may experience damage in our lives, health issues, loss in relationships, strain in our relationships, loss of finances, delays in the things that we were waiting on and that we, we are promised that we begin to doubt will happen. But like the definition, God can restore, God can re-establish, return those things to what they were and better. In 1 Peter 5.10, in His kindness, God called you to share in His eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, He will restore, support and strengthen you. He will place you on a firm foundation. See friends, difficult times may come, but God gives you strength. It says He gives you strength to face the hardships and support to navigate them. Despite the circumstances, we can stand firm knowing He is goddess. So my question to you, are there areas in your life that you're needing restoration, that you're needing to be brought back into a previous good condition? Are there areas in, in my life, areas of loss that you've experienced that you need to be reestablished in relationships, in provision, in boldness, in confidence? in physical health, in mental health, in peace, in rest. See, there's many, um, many accounts that we see in the Bible of restoration. Job experienced terrible hardship. He lost everything. But he chose to trust God, despite what everyone else around him said, and he received back what was lost and more. Ruth and Naomi experienced the loss of their husbands and their families. But as they chose to follow God, and they chose to, to follow his lead, they experienced restoration through marriage to Boaz. Joseph and his brothers, through the power of forgiveness, shifted away from a place of jealousy, a place of broken relationship, to a place of restoration to good relationship. You know, in all these stories, none of them were without struggle, none of them were without hard times. But each and every one of these individuals and these people didn't let, didn't let go of God and they saw his restorative power work in their lives. You know, of late, our messages have been a lot of calls to actions, pursuing change, the shift, loving God, loving people, choosing well, creating space, serving others, that we've had a call to action. But can I encourage you, my friend, with the call of action, there is an outcome that God is bringing restoration He's bringing restoration to your life and my life. How amazing is that? That the God of the universe is wanting to bring restoration through us through, through the calls to action. He's bringing us restoration. So can I encourage you, my friends, today? Hold on to God. Stay the course. Stand firm in Him. Stay the course. Keep looking to Him. Keep inquiring of Him. So let me encourage you with all that in the story from the Bible about restoration. So lots of accounts already, but I want to look at a specific account in Acts chapter 3. This is, the, this is the account of the healing of the lame man at Gate Beautiful, reading from Acts 3 verses 1 to 8. Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the Beautiful Gate, so he can beg from people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, Look at us. The lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver and gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. What an amazing story. The power of God working mightily through Peter to bring restoration to a man who'd been lame from birth. But see, there's another story of restoration here, that the Holy Spirit worked through Peter and restored him in his boldness and courage to see the healing of this man. 
Because in, in, before the crucifixion of Jesus, Peter was discouraged because he denied him three times. And here he was restored to his boldness and confidence in Holy Spirit. See, my friends, God is interested in bring, bringing restoration into our lives. And you may think your restoration is too hard to achieve. You may think your restoration is too far gone. But can I tell you today, nothing is too hard for God. Nothing is too far gone that God can't bring restoration. Nothing is too far out of His reach that He cannot bring His restorative power to your life. And you know, I woke up this morning that that's a word for someone. That, you know, you've, you need restoration of hope in your life. Proverbs talks about hope deferred makes the heart sick. That you've been holding on to hope, but you started to let it go because you'd faced disappointment and discouragement. But Hebrews chapter 6 verse 18 says, we have this hope that is an anchor for our soul. That is an anchor for our soul. That when the discouragement comes, that that anchor to our soul for our mind, our will, our emotions, that today God is going to restore that hope in your life. Hope is a confident assurance of what will be done. That God is going to bring that restored into your life. And so if that's for you, receive that this morning because he's in the business of restorative power and he's going to bring that hope back into your life. So where can we see restoration? Relationships with parents, with siblings, with children, with work colleagues, with friends. Perhaps reconciliation, forgiveness needs to take place where there's been strain or tension. Physical health, restoration in your health, whether it's physical health, sickness, chronic health conditions, Maybe you're needing restoration in your mental or emotional health, soundness of mind, breaking through, overcoming anxiety, depression. Perhaps it's restoration to the life you know you're called to, but hardships, trauma, past life circumstances, family of origin stuff have hindered that. Perhaps it's restoration of joy. Peace rests in him after a challenging season. Perhaps like Peter, you need restoration of your confidence or boldness. And perhaps you need restoration of that hope, the hope that is the anchor to your soul. So my friends, what are you needing to be restored? What might you need reestablished? What is in your life that you're needing to encounter the restorative power of Jesus? Can I share with you a couple of encouragements from this story in Acts 3 as you trust God to bring restoration? Firstly, point number one. Be assured of the authority we have in Jesus to see restoration. Be assured of the authority we have to see restoration. See, Peter and John knew the authority they'd been given. Jesus had told them multiple times about their authority that he had given them and that he was living with them. In Luke 10, 19, it says, Listen carefully. I have given you authority that you now possess in, to tread on serpents and scorpions and the ability to exercise authority over all the power of the enemy and nothing will in any way harm you. In Acts 1.8, before Jesus left the earth, he said, but you will receive power and ability when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses to tell people about me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria, and even to the ends of this world, earth. So what does this mean for you and I today, friends? Friends, we have authority in Jesus' name to see re restoration. In verse 6, Peter says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazarene, get up and walk. Friends, there is power in declaring the name of Jesus. There is great power in declaring the name of Jesus. Why is this? That we heard about in the communion that Jesus through his death and resurrection achieved the ultimate victory. Victory over sin, victory over death, victory over sickness. Therefore, the name of Jesus is more powerful than any other being, than any other condition, than any other circumstance. The name of Jesus is above any other name you, you will face. And we see this declared in Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 to 10. Rather, he, Jesus, made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and in heaven and earth and under the earth. See, as we declare Jesus' name or our situation, we declare his lordship. We declare his authority over our lives. As we speak out his name, we enforce the victory that he has already won. The circumstances may not change immediately, but the power that is automatically released when we declare his name is mighty. 
that power is mighty. But also our posture changes, our stance changes, our outlook. We have assurance and confidence that we will see God's mighty power at work as we declare his name. You know, my prayer echoes Paul's prayer in Ephesians 1, 19 to 21, for me and for all of us. I also pray that you and I will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honour at God's right hand in heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but in the world to come. That is my prayer that we will understand the greatness that I would understand the greatness of his power that's available to us. See, across these scripture, the word power and authority is used multiple times. And there's different original Greek words that he's described them. One of them is donamis, which means or can be translated from the Greek to mean an inherent strength or ability that is exerted, a power for performing miracles, a power for influence. One of the other words is exousia, which can be translated from the Greek to mean power of choice, power of liberty, power of authority, influence, of right and privilege. What amazing original words that you and I have inherent strength. You and I have inherent ability, mighty power to see miracles happen, mighty power for influence, to walk in liberty in our everyday lives. Friends, that you and I can look to God for His power, declaring His authority in our everyday lives in Jesus' name. But that all sounds good in theory, right? But like, how does this actually outwork? How do we practically, practically do this in our everyday life? Well, firstly, you can speak the name of Jesus out over whatever situation you face. See, the name of Jesus is applied when powerful when you're part of the situation. If you're facing sickness, I declare the name of Jesus over that sickness. If you're facing stress, anxiety, I declare the name of Jesus over my stress and anxiety. And it can be applied and should be applied to your situation. I've got a little tool to demonstrate this a little bit. I've got this here today. It's called a force pen. may not unravel very well. But a force pen is a tool designed to help with recovery. So a picture should come up on the screen shortly. If you've got a joint or a muscle that's a little bit sore, what you can do is tightly wrap the force pen around that area. By temporarily restricting the, the blood flow to that body part, once it's released, there's a rush of blood that flows to the area. As the rush of blood flows to the area, it brings with it different chemical medias, home, mediators and hormones that then aid recovery. So it's used as a recovery tool. It brings restoration to that injured or damaged joint, muscle, or body part. See, I've got one of this. This is the one I carry in my gym bag. But if it just sits in my gym bag, it actually isn't doing anything. See, it needs to be applied to my sore knee, my sore calf in that picture, or sore ankle in order to see the restorative power. It's the same with the name of Jesus. We might know it in theory, but we need to apply it. We can declare it in our everyday lives to see his authority, to see his power outwork in our lives. So we speak out the name of Jesus of our situation. But also you and I need to know and can know and use the tools we have for enforcing his victory. In 2 Corinthians 10, 4, it says, the weapons of our warfare are not physical, weapons of flesh and blood. Our weapons are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. See, the weapons we have, his word, prayer, worship, sharing with other believers, powerful tools. Let's be honest, on Sunday, like we, we, we use them all. We have prayer, we have worship, we have fellowship with one another. We have his word that we come around. So we feel great, we feel hyped up on Sunday. But what does it look like on a Monday to Saturday? Right, I ask myself the same question. What does it look like on a Monday to Saturday? You know, sometimes the busyness of life, routine, work, family, takes us away from knowing the weapons we have. Or we kind of lose sight of it. Our thoughts can go down a rabbit hole. Will I really see that restorative power? Can I really believe for that? See, this is something I'm learning to do, that I need to apply the weapons that we have, apply the authority we have in my life. A couple of months ago after I preached, Pastor Naomi was encouraging me um, in, in my giftings and my preaching. And I left that conversation going like, oh, cool, this is good. But you know, you get into your everyday life and I got home and getting ready for the week, doing like all the things you need to do to get ready for the week of work. And this thought started to creep into my mind. And I knew this thought was a lie. I knew this thought wasn't truth. But the thought was, do you really want to have those giftings? Do you really want to walk in those things? Because, you know, the Apostle Paul had giftings too. 
But we all know what happened to him. You know, he suffered greatly for his faith. He was martyred. He died alone. And, you know, this, I knew there were, they were thoughts and lies that were coming from the enemy. But I wasn't prepared to, I wasn't ready to know and use the weapons I had for him. So I just let that thought sit in my mind. And, you know, it got to Monday and it was still there. And I was at work and my workmates were like, well, you're very subdued this morning. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. I just don't feel right. But it was just that, that niggling thought in my mind. But then at the end, I got to the end of the day, I was driving in my car and I knew I had to do something about it. I needed to know the weapons that I had to enforce the victory. So I had some worship music playing in my car. And as I had that worship music playing, the word, the word that came to me was Philipp, um, from Philippians 3, where Paul says, I com- compare, consider everything loss compared to the passing worth of knowing Christ and the power of his resurrection. And, you know, in that moment, as I spoke that words out in my car, there's a few tears involved, as there usually is in those moments with God. But as I spoke those words out, it was like instantaneously that weight was lifted. As I applied the tools I had, the weapons I had, instantaneously that was removed from my life. And can I encourage you, my friends, that's not just something that's unique to me. That's available for you and I today. See, knowing the tools he had and applying them to my life took away those lies that I was thinking and brought truth that completely obliterated, couldn't get that word out, the thoughts that I had in my mind. So friend, you and I can know and use the tools we have in enforcing his victory. We also can rest and know in confidence that God is working. John 5, 17 says, but Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now. He has never ceased working and I too am working. In Romans 8, 26, it says, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. In the message, it says here, if we don't know how to pray or what to pray, it doesn't matter. He does our praying in and for us. How amazing is that? That Holy Spirit does His praying in in us and for us. And through this power and authority is released into our situation. So friends, be encouraged that you and I have authority because of Jesus. And we can and will see restoration come to pass. See, from this story, we also see that we experience God God and his power and his timing. Peter and John had been with Jesus to see multiple miracles when he fed the 5,000, when he healed a paralyzed man whose friends lowered him through the roof, the healing of the woman of the issue of blood, the raising of Jairus' daughter from death to life. Peter and John had experienced Jesus' power firsthand. But this power wasn't limited to when Jesus was on the earth. In Acts 2, after Holy Spirit was given, the apostles performed signs and wonders We see this in Acts 2, 43. A sense of awe was felt by everyone and many wonders and signs attesting miracles were taking place through the apostles. The disciples, Peter and John, had seen what Jesus can do. They had the benefit of hindsight. They could look back and go like, Jesus has done that before. Jesus left us his authority. They too had experienced Jesus' mighty power working through them as we see in Acts 2 in the early church. Friends, the same applies for you and I today we too can experience Jesus' power firsthand. The question I have for you though, have you and I experienced his power? See, if I went around the room, I'm sure I could hear testimony after testimony of people who have seen God's power and work in their lives or in others' lives, provisions of, of jobs, of homes, of finances, healing, breakthrough in a situation, a long-awaited relationship, a promised child. That's God's power and operation. Perhaps you've experienced His power in the past, but haven't in a long time and would like to. Or perhaps you haven't and would like to. Or maybe you haven't and you're like, oh, I'm still a bit unsure about this. I don't know what it looks like. Can I encourage you wherever you are on this journey? That's okay. Because it is a journey. But God will meet you. God will encounter you. And He wants to demonstrate His power in and through you. See, this is something I've had to learn to walk in through. Too. Although I grew up in church, I can honestly say like I didn't actually experience God's power until I was an adult because you hear all about the power of God and all that and you're like, yeah, that sounds cool, but it was all theory. It was head knowledge. It hadn't translated into heart knowledge or personal experience. But it was experiencing it that changed everything for me. See, I remember a specific time when I was doing a mission stint with YWAM, Youth with a Mission, and 
um, it was the night before we were going out to minister in the slums and we were, we were praying as a young adult team before we went out into the slums. And while we were praying, I suddenly felt like this, this bubbling inside of me that's, you know, I can describe it like a bubbling of water. And now I understand it as rivers of living water that will come out of you. By that point, I was just like, oh, I just felt like this, this bubbling, like these words are going to come out of me. Um, and I had this word for one of the specific young girls on our team. And it was a word from the story of Ruth. Now, I'd heard the story of Ruth, but I didn't actually know the Scripture that well. But all of a sudden, the words that came out from it were like word for word from the Scripture that your people will be your, my people and your God will be my God. And, you know, we, we were both like overwhelmed by the power of God in, in that moment in a good way. Like, you know, there was just such, such a tangible presence of God that um, the whole team felt and there was just such a rest and a settledness of us. But as soon as that word was delivered, it was like there was a calm that that gushing stopped. And I spoke to her after and she was like, you know, that was something that God had been speaking to her about, about moving to a different place, about doing some mission work in the future. I didn't know that, but Holy Spirit knew. And, you know, and I experienced that power and that, was, that changed the trajectory of my following Jesus because it went from theory to heart to experience. It went from head knowledge to heart knowledge. See, that was nearly eight years ago now. But I remember that moment. I remember the words I gave her like literally like it was yesterday. I remember the feeling, the experience. That is the power of experiencing God. Experiencing God for yourself is life transforming. See, when I was in Malaysia, not long after, I spoke to one of my family members and we were talking about some of my experiences while with YWAM. And it was interesting because they were like, oh, what was that like? Like, you know, what is it like to experience God's power? What's it like to, to hear God speak to you? And that really got me thinking, like this is the person who'd been in church their whole life, but they hadn't experienced His power. The great news is though, my friend, that we can experience His power working in and through us. And that is my encouragement for you this morning, that you can experience it and you can see His power working through you. In John 14, verse 12 to 14, it says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I've done and even greater works because I'm going to be the Father. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me anything in my name and I will do it. Friends, you and I can experience Jesus' power firsthand. We can see Him demonstrate His miraculous power in and through us. But you know, one of the big things that I found is often this restoration Often this experience of His power is in his, his perfect timing. And that's sometimes the hard time because it doesn't quite fit with my timeline. See, in verse 2 of Acts 3, it says, As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called Beautiful Gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. Each day the man was put by the gate. See, this un it's unlikely that this is the first time that Peter and John had walked past this man. In later accounts, it said he was over 40 years old. So if every day he was, he was lame from birth and from whatever age he was put out there, he'd probably been there a while. But it was this moment that God in his sovereignty decided to send Peter and John to bring restoration power to this man's life. So my encouragement to you this morning is if you're yet to see the restoration take place, if you're waiting on the restoration power, stay the course. Stay the course. His restoration power will come into your life in His perfect timing. He is the best and highest for you and He will see it come to pass in His perfect timing. We will see His restorative power. And there's great outcome when we see the restoration power. In Acts 3 it says, Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up and stood on his feet and began to walk. Then walking, leaping and praising God, he went to the temple with them. The lame man was asking for money. He was looking for a natural solution, a temporary natural solution. But God had a lasting supernatural solution for him. See, the outcome of restorative power is that we can watch God do the supernatural. Restorative powder, we can watch God do the supernatural in our lives. See, in Bible commentaries, Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, used very specific wording, wording around this man's feet and ankles. Luke was a doctor. So the original wording speaks of the bones, the joints and the ankles instantaneously being brought back into their sockets and strengthened and straightened. 
Now, I don't know about you, but that's not something that happens naturally. Normally, if things are broken out of alignment, they need screws and pins and medical intervention to be realigned, to be straightened. But in that instant, in the power of Jesus' name, through that declaration, declaration that the man's feet and ankles were instantly strengthened, straightened, and he leaped to his feet. Friends, you and I can see God supernaturally bring restoration to your life. But you know, another incredible outcome is that people around were drawn in and heard the amazing truth of Jesus. Friends, your restoration testifies to others about Jesus, about who He is and what He does. In verse 9 to 11, it says, All the people saw Him and heard Him walking and praising God. They knew this guy. He'd been put out the gate every single day. When they realised He was the lame beggar that had been there so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade, where the man was holding on tightly to Peter and John. We see after this and later on Acts 3, Peter then has the opportunity to address the crowd. He delivers a sermon speaking of Jesus. See friends, your restoration, the lame man's restoration speaks to others about Jesus. We see later in Acts 4 that it says, everyone was praising God for this miraculous sign, the healing of a man who had been lame for more than 40 years. It's never too late, my friends. 40 years is a long time to wait for your healing, isn't it? Hopefully we don't always have to wait so long for everything. But as I wrap up this morning, I ask the question again, what are you needing to be restored? As I've been speaking, is there an area that you identify that you've experienced loss or difficulty that needs God restorative power? Health, relationships, strength, boldness, joy, peace, courage, hope, faith. What are you needing to see restoration in? Can I encourage you this morning, my friend, that He will restore that which is lost. He will restore that which is lost. You and I can be assured of the authority we have in Him to see restoration. You and I can experience His power in His perfect timing. So let's be people, my friends, who apply His authority into our lives who seek after Him, who experience His power and who see restoration take place. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank You that Your name is the name above every name. I thank You for the restorative power that comes as we declare Your name. And I just pray an outpouring of Your presence and Your power in each and every one of our lives that we would be so sure of who we are in You and that we will see restoration in our lives. Things being reestablished, things that are lost or damaged, reestablished. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we've heard this morning that God wants to continually bring restoration in, into our lives. But I want to encourage you today, if you don't know Jesus personally, first and foremost, there has to be a restoration of yourself, your soul to God, your spirit to God. He wants to know you personally. Now in Romans 10 verse 9, it says that if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That is where your first restoration starts. That's where life begins. I just want to encourage you that Jesus offers forgiveness. Jesus offers salvation. He offers love to each and every single one of us. He offers a relationship with God through Jesus. You may have heard this before, but I'll say it again. God loves you so much that He sent His Son, Jesus. Now, if you don't know Him personally today, I, maybe, maybe you're watching online, maybe you're in the room right now, and maybe you've just thrown out the white flag to life. Maybe like the loss is too much, the grief is too much, the deep hurts and pain, it's too much. I'm just waving the white flag. That's it. I'm I'm tapping out. It's too hard. I want to encourage you, it doesn't have to be that way. That doesn't have to be your light in life. As you enter into a relationship with God and you begin that restoration with Him, He begins to put those things right. He brings healing to your heart. So if you're in this room right now or you're watching online and you don't know God personally, haven't come into a relationship with Him, I want to give you the opportunity today. Can we just close our eyes for a moment? 
you know, just as you've heard me speaking, if anything's resonated true for you today, I, I want to give you the opportunity to pray a prayer. Asking God to come into your heart, come into relationship with Him. Maybe you've prayed it before, maybe you've never prayed it. But I, I want to give you the, this moment now just to repeat this prayer after me. If you're watching online, you can do this, do, the, do this with us together. Everybody, look, let's, let's pray this prayer right now. Dear God, I thank you that you sent Jesus. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. Forgive me of my sins. I surrender my life to you. I come into relationship with you. And from this day on, I choose to follow Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray that that message was a blessing to you. If you made a decision to follow Jesus, first of all, congratulations. We think that that is incredible. And secondly, if you go to gc.org.au forward slash first steps, our team has put together some resources as well as there's some information there for how you can get in contact with one of our pastors because we'd love to encourage you and connect you into the life of the church.